I know this is a very corporate-y looking video. It's just I don't have any places to film yet as we're still putting everything together. But I wanted to have an important conversation about some of the forward-facing tech that we're going to be seeing as we move forward into next generation CPUs. And that is specifically CU DIMM. CU DIMM is going to be pretty damn interesting, especially as we see memory speeds start to exceed 10,000 megatransfers per second. So let's talk about CU DIMM, some things you should know, and some ways to keep from having some compatibility issues in the future if you don't pay attention to what RAM you're grabbing off the shelf or bleep blooping in your cart online. We interrupt this video to bring you a special message from iFixit. No, we interrupt this interruption with this interruption about new stuff from iFixit. We should even grab this card, but inventory sucks. Fix the inventory problems with iFixit. Whoa, don't drop it. Can't fix that with iFixit. Just kidding, yes you can. Wish you could take iFixit with you anywhere, but your pockets aren't big enough. Introducing the new Moray. And the new Minnow. Take them with you anywhere. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below for discounts and savings and explosions. More explosions. Even more explosions. Why are you still here? Click the description now. I'm also going to apologize for any weird street noise you may hear. As you can tell, there is a street nearby, and this is not one of our soundproofish rooms that we built. Uh, anyway, so DIMM, D-I-M-M, -M, basically it stands for Dual Inline Memory Module. And we've seen DIMMs for a long time, but basically people just refer to DIMM as a stick of RAM. Uh, and UDIMM, uh, as we've talked about here, basically just means that it is an unbuffered memory module. Uh, so this is the kind of RAM that you're used to seeing with like DDR2, 3, 4. Um, it's non-registered, it's not ECC, it's not server grade, it's really just consumer grade. It's dumb. All it is is a stick that has memory modules on there that the memory controller, whether it be older memory controllers that were on board or newer memory controllers that are on die uh, for CPUs, just have access to all of that stored information um, and, and they're pretty stupid, if you will. They don't do anything other than hold your data. And it's up to the CPU's memory controller or the memory controller and whatever your config is to go and fetch that data. Now, obviously, any time it takes to go and fetch data uh, takes time, right? So there's latency involved. The time for the CPU to say, hey, we need updated data, sends out to the, to the memory module, goes and finds the information, loads it into the CPU cache, and then processes it and does what it's going to do. Now, as memory has gotten faster and faster and faster, and I mean, if we go all the way back to like DDR2, I mean, we were, t we were talking like, what, 233 megahertz, right? And then DDR3, we started to see what, 1333 megahertz. And then DDR4, we were seeing like 200 or 2400 megahertz as like kind of getting up there in speeds. Like 1866 is kind of like where a lot of the RAM started for like DDR4. I think it was 1866. Maybe that was at the high end of DDR3. I forget. It's been a long time. Uh, but I'm going to digress there and say that as RAM has gotten faster, just like when you push your CPU's clock speeds to the limit, it really starts to become somewhat unstable. So that's why as you buy faster and faster RAM, sometimes you may or may not be able to run the advertised speeds with your CPU because it puts all of that stress on the internal memory controller on your CPU's. Now both Intel and AMD's modern uh, platforms, and by modern I mean probably anything in the last seven years, pretty much have been using uh, IMCs or internal memory controllers that are on the chip itself. Now, as it gets faster and faster, it's got to share uh, not only new, like electrons from the voltages coming into the CPUs that then have to again get distributed amongst the other things that are on the die itself. So we're talking about our cores, we're talking about the, the obviously the cache, we're talking about any sort of I.O., which is input-output when it comes to the CPU connectivity. Um, obviously the cores themselves, which I think I already said, and the internal memory controller also needs voltage. So there's a lot happening in a very small condensed area. So as the memory gets faster, and now we're talking 6,000 plus megahertz on traditional UDIMs. Uh, I think we sell over 7,000 megahertz now on UDIM, 7,200 or something like that. This is where CUDIM or clocked uh, unbuffered RAM comes in. Now what the CXL technology basically does is it puts a clock driver physically on the DIM itself. So what this is doing now is actually boosting the frequency. It's kind of like a repeater, if you will, where it is taking that clock frequency and no longer is it just a dumb stick of RAM that is just holding it, it's just a container for information. It is now able to intelligently serve that information through the CXL technology so that the CPU benefits from faster uh, transfer speeds, 
which now I think Crucial is advertising over 10,000 mega transfers coming by the end of the year. I know we're up to like 9,200 megahertz. I think um, Crucial, I, I think Kingston or the A-Data, one of them advertised already like 9,600 mega transfers. And uh, I think the kits that we're going to be seeing debut right now with AeroLake's platform is going is like up to 8,400 megahertz. So it's kind of insane when you think about that. But you, it's also kind of insane if you think about the sensitivity that that frequency can have for any sort of degradation in signal, if you will, between the DIMM and the CPU's memory controller. So by having that driver basically built into the DIMM, it's allowing those speeds to now accelerate even farther and faster than we've ever seen. I think the jump we've seen going from 6,000 megahertz RAM to now nearly 10,000 megahertz RAM is only a couple of years. Now look how long it took for DDR4 to go from like 2,400 megahertz to about 20 or 5,000 megahertz. Like that doubling in speed took pretty much like the entire life of DDR4. And DDR4 came out, I wanna say in 2014, 2015, I can't remember the exact date, we can put it on the screen. So if you could, if we consider like Moore's law, then that definitely tells you that things are getting faster and faster. But where is that going to benefit? Like, d does it benefit you? Well, if you're an enthusiast PC gamer and you're running high-end hardware, let's say you're running a 4090 or you're planning on getting a 5090 and you want to overclock it and you want to water cool it and you want to squeeze out every last drop of performance that you can possibly get, that means high frame rates. That also means bottlenecking. Now, one of the ways that we have seen to get an uplift in performance in, in games FPS is not just faster memory, which there is an uplift, and we've seen an uplift of nearly 10% FPS by going with, say, more standard traditional DDR5 speeds of around 5,000 megahertz. 4,800 megahertz is essentially like the, the base clock for, for DDR5. But by going from like 5,000 to even just say like 6,400, you can see almost 10% improvement depending on the title, depending on the resolution, depending on the settings. There's a lot of the asterisks in there. There's a lot of depends on. But if you're going in there and just trying to push the frequency uh, and the FPS as far, as far as you possibly can, one of the ways that we've seen uplift in performance too is by getting tighter timings. Now, by being able to have this driver built into the, the DIM module itself, not only is the speed and the transfer speed going extremely high, but the latency is actually reducing as well because of the fact that it is boosting that signal back to the CPU. This is probably a terrible analogy and I'm kind of known for these, but I feel like the information now, instead of having a pitcher throwing a baseball to the catcher and then the catcher's throwing the baseball back, the pitcher's now one of those pitch machines that shoots the ball and now the RAM is gonna shoot the ball back to the CPU extremely quick. So what that's gonna mean is an uplift in performance pretty much in any sort of task that benefits from memory speeds. Now, average gamers are probably not going to notice or even be interested in the cost that this is going to have because this is, this is now putting a lot more testing, a lot more cost, and a lot more manufacturing nuances, if you will, on the memory uh, manufacturers. Because all the memory manufacturers had to worry about before was, is the pinout correct? Is the voltages like basically adjusted properly? And are all of the modules, is all of the NAND doing what it's supposed to do? If the answer is yes, there's RAM. Did we use quality components and, and um, IMCs that are allowing us, or uh, SMCs that are allowing us to push the speeds farther? Cool, then we'll just advertise it as uh, profiles for XMP or Expo, and then it's onto the CPU's memory controller to determine whether or not it's got the quality to be able to run at the advertised speeds. Now it's a lot more on the heads of the, or the shoulders of the memory manufacturers. So you can probably expect there to be a pretty significant cost premium to uh, CU DIMMs in the future. This, there's, there's a couple of different categories that this fall under. One, enthusiast class system, like I've already said, highest tier quality everything because you wanna squeeze every last performance out of it. Or you're the kind of person that just goes, I want the latest and greatest of everything and you're willing to take on the extra cost that it takes to be that person. Those people exist. Uh, I have been that before, not as much these days. Like, I really don't run out and upgrade my system anytime something newer or greater comes out. I do tend to wait a few years now, like a couple of years usually. So 
there's a diminished return in cost to performance, obviously, by doing that, especially if you're an enthusiast gaming rig. I mean, these are gonna, this, this type of platform now, when it comes to CU DIM, it's really gonna benefit people that are doing um, extreme compiling, people are doing AI uh, engineering. AI is benefiting from the memory speeds greatly. Um, obviously, servers or enterprise type solutions, any, anyone that really needs fast, fast RAM. So it's kind of it's honestly kind of a stopgap between like registered dims and non unregistered dims. So it's kind of giving you better stability. It's giving you better performance. It's giving you uh, huge capacities as well. Because capacity is the other end of the story, where having a massive amount of RAM also puts more stress on the IMC or the memory controller it's, itself. So having the driver built in also now makes that faster RAM more accessible to the CPU as well. So it's actually kind of like the next step where the, where the DIM is now almost becoming like a daughter board in a way. So it's becoming way more intelligent. Um, let's go ahead and talk about compatibility though, because you might be wondering why like, can I just buy a CU DIM RAM and stick it on a non-CU DIM CPU or platform? The answer is no, because the, the platform itself, specifically the CPU and the chipset, have to be compatible with CU DIMs. Now, chipsets that are compatible with CU DIMs are also compatible with U DIMs, but not the other way around. You cannot put CU DIM RAM on a non-CU DIM platform. So this is why I say you need to kind of be mindful of when you're grabbing stuff and putting it in your cart, that they're compatible. Now, it's gonna be pretty obvious, I think. You might be asking yourself going, why is this 32 gigs of DDR5, and I'm just throw a number out there, $400, and this 32 gigs of CU DIM or non-CU DIM is $200? Well, that would be your answer right there. If it's got a weird, expensive price, it's probably a CU DIM. I hope the, the manufacturers make the packaging pretty obvious. Brands that we know that are gonna be launching CU DIM with AeroLake, because AeroLake is the first platform for consumer grade that actually utilizes CU DIM, um, is going to be, uh, we have some Kingston RAM uh, that's coming out. We got ADATA, Crucial. Uh, I don't know if Corsair has announced any yet. Um, Team Group, I believe, even has some. So you can expect it to come out from all of the manufacturers. Now let's talk about some downsides. Downsides are the fact that right now for AeroLake, because of the CU DIM thing going on, there is no QVL yet for AeroLake. So that's kind of scary because for my testing, by the time you guys watch this, testing is, is happening, but the review embargo hasn't been lifted yet. I'm using UDIM for my test because I need to make sure that when we're testing CPU performance itself, that we're not contaminating our test by having AeroLake running CU DIM and getting the benefits of the faster RAM while the other platforms are using UDIM. Now that's a, that's a reasonable discussion though, to say if you are running AeroLake, that's a benefit of the platform, but I wanna isolate the CPU's architecture separately, and then UDIM versus CUDIM will be a separate content piece. I think you're gonna see a lot of people either on their initial launches of the review embargo lift showing probably both, but we're gonna test them separately from each other. And then I'm also gonna go as far as saying, I'm gonna test CU DIM base clock of 6400. So that's the CU DIM's base is 6400. That's where it starts versus traditional U DIM 6400 to see if there's any difference there. If there is no difference there, then I think the answer for most gamers is that it's not gonna be beneficial. Uh, might be beneficial once we start, once you start getting into the 9,000, 10,000 megahertz uh, or mega transfers territory. I have no idea what the cost looks like. It's probably gonna be pretty damn mind-blowing on how expensive it's gonna be. I have a feeling it's gonna be very, very pricey. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, AeroLake, even though we're all a little skeptical right now of Intel, is more than just a CPU architecture upgrade. It really is an entire platform upgrade and CU DIMS is where that's gonna launch. Just like uh, how AM5 on AM, for AMD, when I went to AM5, like DDR5 was the only memory module available for it, whereas Intel kind of had that overlap where you could get DDR4 boards and DDR5 boards for 13th and 14th gen and 12th gen as well. Obviously, Arrow Lake is going to be DDR5 only. Still waiting to see what kind of QVL certification happens now with non-CU DIMs, because I feel like there's gonna be a lot of focus there on CU DIM. But anyway, I want to put this discussion out there first um, because I don't want to spend a lot of time in the initial embargo review talking about CU DIM because we also need to get more hands on with it. This is going to be the CU DIM was really just shown at Computex only a few months back for the first time. 
And it really is something that was more or less designed for more enterprise-y type solutions. But there's benefits to gamers as well if you're building the, a system that can utilize that level of transfer speed. I don't think many people would think it is surprising to probably go out on a limb and say, it's not beneficial for most gamers at the price point. Like the price to performance ratio is probably pretty skewed. But if you're the kind of person that's like, I want the newest, latest, and greatest, you're not gonna care anyway, especially if you have deep pockets. All right, guys, there we go. Sound off in the comments below if you're interested in CU DIM. If you've been following that, is there some sort of use case that you use where you think CU DIM would truly benefit you? And I'm not just talking about games, but I mean some other task that you're doing where you're like, I cannot wait for clocked unbuffered RAM because of the fact that it's going to make your life that much better. And I'd really like to know what those use cases are because it helps us kind of prepare for that, those future reviews when we're trying to put ourselves in the shoes of someone that might need that technology. All right, guys, thanks for watching. As always, we'll see you in the next one. Time to get back to testing Air Lake.